that song right before we got into How Great Thou Art, which was beautiful and one of my favorites, it says, uh, Jesus, you're more than enough for me. You're my healer. and all, Everything is possible. With him, do you believe that? I mean, it's one thing to sing it. Do you believe that Jesus is more than enough for you? He heals all your diseases, and nothing is impossible with him? Sometimes I think we're tempted to doubt that. Which leads me to another question. How many of you have ever experienced or witnessed a miracle? Show of hands this morning. You're like, oh, I don't want to look like a weirdo. So, but, but anybody? And I don't mean you found five bucks in your pocket you forgot you put there a week ago. Or you pulled in and, oh, the, there's a spot right in front. We're late and there's a, it's a Christmas miracle. There's a parking spot. I don't mean that kind of miracle. I mean undeniable, has to be supernatural intervention. This shouldn't happen, but it did. Anybody? Some of you? We're going to talk about miracles, why they exist, what they're recorded for in the Bible, what they're really about, the purpose of them here this morning as we continue in our series, a year-long study of the book of Acts. But before we do that, let me just bring us up to speed a little bit. In case you've not been with us or you've, uh, you've uh, forgotten what we're talking about, we've been studying the book of Acts with the exception of the Advent season from the beginning since this fall. And in AD 30, Jesus dies on the Roman cross. Three days later, he's raised from the dead. Shortly thereafter, he ascends into heaven. Fifty days after his, his resurrection, uh, the celebration of Pentecost is happening, the Jewish festival in Jerusalem. The city is bursting at the seams. There's only 120 Christians in the world. They're meeting together, waiting for the promised Holy Spirit, who comes upon them in power at Pentecost. The apostles are full of the Holy Spirit, and they proclaim the wonders of God in different tongues. People are amazed by this. Peter seizes the moment, gives the first sermon in church history, and 3,000 people are converted. Now, this small 120-person church is exploding in, in Jerusalem. As the church grows, so grows its, um, its, its, the spread of its influence and its struggle and opposition. So at the same time the church is growing rapidly, you have also internal struggle and conflict and external opposition. This opposition grows to the point where at one point in 32 AD, a man named Stephen gives a speech connecting the Old Testament prophet and law to Jesus as the Messiah. Many people are moved, but the religious leaders in Jerusalem are angered. And they, and they incite the mob to stone him to death. That makes him the first Christian martyr in church history. And that kicks off a really intense persecution. And the Christians, all but the apostles, flee the city of Jerusalem. Because up to this point, Christianity has only existed in Jerusalem. Now they all flee out into the Roman world uh, for their lives, basically. But God uses this persecution and spreading to accomplish his purpose. Because in Acts 1.8, he said, You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And they hadn't left yet, and he uses what looked like it was evil to accomplish his good plan. So now they spread to Judea, Samaria, and we'll, as we'll see, to the ends of the earth. Revival breaks out in Samaria through a guy's preaching named Philip. God takes Philip south to meet an Ethiopian eunuch. A remarkable, uh, miraculous encounter and his transformation and conversion to Christ. And in the meanwhile, this is going on. A man named Saul, who's responsible for the persecution of the Christians in Jerusalem, is chasing them all the way to Damascus on the road. God knocks him off his horse, causes him to go blind and for a time, and then has the Christians come minister to him. And he's the one trying to persecute them, even kill them. And his heart has changed, and he becomes the Apostle Paul, the man who wrote more than half of what you're going to read starting this week, the New Testament. It's a, a miraculous thing going on here. And up to this point, we don't know much about the apostles from back in chapter 4. We don't hear a lot about them. They haven't left the city much. All the activity is going on outside of Jerusalem, and it's led by other leaders. But at the end of Acts chapter 9, we pick up an interesting story in counting the apostle Peter. Let's turn in our Bibles or on the screens or in your Acts journals if you still use those to Acts chapter 9. Verses 31 to 43. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. Pause there for just a minute. That's a radical difference from Acts chapter 8 verse 4 which says that they all fled for their lives. Saul was going house to house ravaging the church. Now a chapter later, there's peace and it's spreading. Verse 32. Now as Peter went here and there among them all, he came down also to the saints who lived at Lydda. There he found a man named Aeneas, bedridden for eight years, who was paralyzed. And Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Rise and make your bed. And immediately he rose, and all the residents of Lydda and Sharon saw him, and they turned to the Lord. 
Now there was in Joppa a disciple named Tabitha, which translated means Dorcas. That's an unfortunate name. She was full of good works and acts of charity. In those days she became ill and died. And when they had washed her, they laid her in an upper room. Since Lida was near Joppa, the disciples, hearing that Peter was there, sent two men to him, urging him, Please come to us without delay. So Peter rose and went with them. And when he arrived, they took him to the upper room. All the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing tunics and other garments that Dorcas made while she was with them. But Peter put them all outside, knelt down, and prayed. And turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up. And he gave her his hand and raised her up. Then calling the saints and the widows, he presented her alive. And it became known throughout all Joppa that many and many believed in the Lord. And he stayed in Joppa for many days with one Simon, a tanner. Again, a remarkable, miraculous story and account here. We haven't heard much about the apostles until this point. Now we hear Peter is actually leaving and going to see what's going on in Judea, in the regions of Judea, the spread of the gospel and the growth of the church. Now we see Peter, um, he's on this trip sort of checking out what God's up to, encouraging and visiting the saints in those, in those regions. Uh, here at the end of chapter 9, we read these two stories, these miraculous stories. One, a healing of a paralytic, and one, raising a dead person to life. And I think we should ask the question, why, why are these stories in there? To wow us? What, what is the purpose of miracles in the Bible? To impress us? A divine display of power? To, 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 to fill us with awe and wonder? To show us how powerful God is? What is the reason we're given these miracles? This is the question I want to address as we go through this passage. Because these two miracles, like almost every other miracle recorded in the New Testament, are given for the same ultimate purpose. In case you missed it, we get hints of it in verse 35 of chapter 9. Chapter 9, verse 35, we're told, after he raised, uh, healed Aeneas, all the residents of Lydda and Sharon saw him, and they turned to the Lord. And then in verse 42, in case you missed that, and it became known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. Peter's given us an, a hint here, turning to the Lord. Sinners turning to Christ for healing and forgiveness. Let's look at how this plays out in the text. Peter travels from Jerusalem to Lydda, a very short trip, by the way. Uh, today, how many of you have ever been to Israel? Anyone been to Israel before? Uh, my wife and I are going with Pastor Brian and, and, and Maureen uh, in March. We're very excited about that. If you ever go to Israel, you'll fly into the airport outside Tel Aviv. The airport is built right on the ancient village of Lida. So you've been to Lida. If you've been to Israel, you probably just didn't even know it. It's not far at all from the city of Jerusalem. That's one of the places the new church was springing up. Peter goes there, and we're told he goes there to visit the saints. Now, when you hear that phrase, saints, how do you grew up in a Roman Catholic tradition? Many of us, many of you. Um, Saints can be a little bit misleading. If you grew up in certain traditions, saints refer to those who have been canonized by the church, super Christians, somehow slightly above the rest of us. They've done uh, things, written things, said things, performed miracles even that the average people can't do, and therefore they're on a different spiritual plane. And that's, by the way, nowhere in the New Testament. Saints simply refers to those who believe in and follow Jesus. He goes to visit the saints at Lydda, not the super Christians at Lydda, those who believe in and follow Jesus in Lydda, the church, in other words. Quite, quite literally, the New Testament says, if you believe Jesus the Christ, the Son of God, and rose from the dead as payment for your sins, and you're living in his strength to follow him, you are a saint, then and now. You ever think of yourself that way? The New Testament says, if you're here this morning and believe in and follow Jesus, you're a saint. Don't, you don't have to call me St. Jeff, but I might, just to make sure you understand, refer to you as St. Marcio, you know. You are. Peter goes to encourage and visit those who love Jesus. Those are the saints. Now, we also read, I've also heard, um, some people say the reason these miracle stories are in there is to encourage us to do the same. A paralyzed person, he meets this man named Aeneas. Now, now, why did Christianity even spread to Lydda? You might be wondering this. How did it get there? And we actually studied this without even knowing it. If you show the map there on the screen, I hope you can see this. If you can, I'll explain it to you. Down there, the bottom blue little dash, blue line. See that down there? That's Gaza. 
Remember in Acts chapter 8 when Philip was taken from Samaria? Look way up to the north in Samaria. South to Gaza to meet the Ethiopian eunuch. That's where he met him. And then after that, that encounter with the Ethiopian eunuch on the road to Gaza, God sends Philip back north to Caesarea. That's the top blue line. So he traveled north along the coast through all that region of Judea to Caesarea. And what did he do on the way? We're told he was preaching the gospel and establishing the church. And what's along the way? Interesting, isn't it? The two red dashes, Lydda and Joppa. Philip had been there. Philip had preached the gospel there. That was the start of the church. So in, in Acts, one of the fascinating things is to see how God is sort of connecting the dots, weaving together these little stories as spreading his church and establishing his gospel. Philip had been there, preached the gospel. A small, fledgling community of believers was there. And now Peter leaves Jerusalem. That's the yellow box. I don't know if you can see it. And goes and heads where Philip's already been to encourage those who love Jesus in that town. I think that's, that's really cool to see how God is connected. And by the way, God's still doing that. Weaving together stories, connecting dots that sometimes seem disconnected to us. So in Lydda, he comes along and finds a man named Aeneas who's been paralyzed for eight years. We don't know anything more about this guy except his name, Aeneas, a very common name in, in the ancient Greek world, and that he's been paralyzed for eight years. We don't know if he had an accident, if we don't know if uh, it was a degenerative disease or what happened. All we know is his name's Aeneas, bedridden for eight years. We don't even know if he's a, a Christian or not. I think we can imply that he is, but the point is we know so little about this man is that he's kind of every man. Could be anybody. Because his condition, physically, paralysis, is a picture to us of our sinful condition apart from Christ. A paralyzed person is unable and incapable of doing anything to change their condition. They can't make themselves walk. Spiritually paralyzed person can do nothing, can take no steps toward God until he first comes to them. I've read some Christians that say that we should... This is to teach us that we should be out seeking and performing these kind of miracles. Now, I want to be clear. I believe with all my heart that we can and we must pray for those who are sick and suffering and hurting and in need. And I believe with all my heart that sometimes God hears us and he can and sometimes does miraculously heal. But I don't believe that's the primary point of the story. Let me explain that. I don't think the primary point of the story is for us to be out seeking to perform or to experience these kind of miracles. Notice something about the, the New Testament when you read it this next eight weeks. None of the apostles who occasionally perform miracles, none of the apostles are ever known as miracle workers. None of them come to town and set up shop and hold a miracles conference. Think of what Peter could have done. He has a reputation. They sent for him in Lydda. He's healed a beggar at the temple courts. People know about him. He apparently has some ability through God's power to heal people. He could have cashed in on that. Charged a lot for the conference. Written bestsellers. Been on the first century talk show circuit if they had such a thing. I mean, he could have made big on this. But Peter understood that miracles was not to bring glory to himself but to bring glory to God. He doesn't come to town shouting miracles, miracles. He comes to town preaching Jesus, Jesus. And there's all the difference in the world. And I think if you, when you watch TV or internet shows and you see faith healers, people who proclaim that, that you know, if you just send this pledge gift or if you just believe enough, there's a miracle for you and that they have that power, you should listen. Are they glorifying Jesus or themselves in their ministry? You should pay careful attention to that. Miracles, you see, always point to a power, a purpose, and a person beyond themselves. They never point to themselves. Miracles themselves are not the point. They're pointing to something and someone else. How many of you have a dog? Aren't dogs awesome? We have a dog named Ivy, and she has issues. We love her, but she, she has some issues. She's a golden doodle, which sounds like it's a dumb name. I'm almost embarrassed to say it. She's a golden retriever and a poodle mixed. And, we, and she's wonderful with the family, but if you come to our house, you must ignore our dog for the first 20 minutes, or she will empty her bladder on the floor. She might do it anyway. Uh, when she's five years old, we're like, when does this stop? Is this, apparently, it's her condition. Anyway, um, you ever point something out to your dog? You ever try to get your dog to like, like, over, go over there? Right? Ivy, look at that. What, the, what does the dog do? They look at your finger, right? Ivy, look. Huh? 
They touch your finger, right? I'd be, no, I'm not over there. Like, oh, they come lick your finger, sniff your finger. You're trying to get your dog to go over there. They're just staring at your finger. They don't understand, right? Their dogs are dumb. Well, they're wonderful, but they're dumb. Even the smart ones, like poodles, they'd stare at your finger. Why? They're missing the point. They, 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 you have to walk them over to the thing. I think there's a sense in which some of us come to the miracles in the Bible and we stare at the finger. We, don't, we miss the point. We look at what the, oh, look what happened. We don't look at what it's pointing us to. We don't look through it to what the point is. Miracles are pointing us somewhere, to someone. In fact, the Gospels often refer to miracles as signs. What's the point of a sign? Look, I'm a sign. Look at me, everybody, I'm a sign. No, to inform you and to point something else out to you. In fact, this miracle story in, in Acts 9 about the healing of Aeneas is a parallel story to another healing that, Jesus, uh, that was done by Jesus himself in, in the book of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew. You might remember this in Matthew chapter 11, or excuse me, 9. Uh, Jesus heals a paralytic in that chapter as well, just like Peter did in Lydda for Aeneas. In this story, Jesus is teaching in a house. Some of you remember this story. And it's crowded. It's jam-packed. Nobody can get in. Four friends bring their paralyzed buddy on a mat, and they can't get in to get to Jesus for a miracle. So what do they do? Anybody remember what they do? They climb up on the roof, and they start tearing it apart. Now, they don't know for sure. I, I, I'm imagining what happens here. They don't know for sure where Jesus is in the house, so I think they're probably digging little holes. Nope, to the left, you know. Move over here, find out where he is. All right. Then they pull the roof apart, and they start lowering this guy down. Can you imagine being the guy? Just, just keep it level, dudes. Don't, you know, I can't, you know. They're right to Jesus' feet. They lower him down. Jesus now, in the middle of teaching, has this paralyzed man down through the roof at his feet. And he says to him, rise. Right? Or he says to him, son, your sins are forgiven. That's what he says first. Which is a curious thing to say. The guy's obviously paralyzed. He's there for maybe a physical healing. And he says, I tell you, your sins are forgiven. Now, the religious leaders in the house hear Jesus say this, and they say to themselves, they grumble in their own heads, who does he think he is? Who does this guy think he is? Only God can forgive sins. Jesus hears their thoughts and answers their thoughts and says, so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, I tell you, rise, take your mat and go. And the guy does. In that story, it's, it's clear as day, pointing us to the purpose of miracles. So that you will know the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, I tell you, rise. I imagine if I was the guy laying there, a little nervous, my friends brought me there, and they lowered me down. And Jesus, the first thing he says is, your sins are forgiven. You might be like, mm, thanks, but I can't walk, right? Maybe you don't really understand what's being done for you yet. But Jesus' point is, what's the greater miracle? What's the greater miracle? To make a lame man walk? It's a pretty big deal. Or to heal the soul? What's the greater miracle? To heal you physically? Get you a job? Reconcile a relationship? Those are all important things. Or to forgive your sin and give you eternal hope. I think we get it wrong. We're so focused in this life on temporal things, on material things. I want this miracle and this. I want, I want this thing in my life fixed. And God is saying, I can do that, but I have so much more for you. Remember, these two accounts of the miraculous healings in, in, in Acts 9 come on the heels of another story, and that's the conversion of the apostle Paul, Saul to Paul, right? The, the greatest enemy, the terrorist of all Christians in the first century, which is what he was, has, has now become the greatest champion of the gospel and builder of the church. Talk about a miracle. These stories in Acts 9 are a continuation of God radically turning things around, turning people around. Again, what's the greater miracle? So when Peter then travels from Lydda to the coastal city of Joppa, and he encounters the recent death of a disciple, a woman named Tabitha in Aramaic, or Dorcas in Greek. I think she probably went by her Aramaic version. You know, don't call me Dorcas, call me Tabitha. Both names mean gazelle. Interesting, isn't it? When, when Peter says, get up, Tabitha, get up. 
Gazelle. Gazelle's known for grace and, and its freedom of movement. And it's just an interesting play on words there. He, he meets this woman. Now, we don't know if they sent for him, if they, if they expected Peter to raise her from the dead. Because maybe they heard that Jesus had done it, and maybe Peter could. Or if they just wanted the comfort an apostle could bring them. Either way, they send for Peter, he shows up, and she's already dead. And it's interesting in the story, there's, they're holding on, they're showing him all these tunics and cloaks and garments that she made. Isn't that what we do when someone we love passes from this life? We hold on to stuff that reminds us of them. Don't we do that? My mother-in-law, we've got some things around our house that remind us of Nana. Things, physical things that either she made or were precious to her that we hold on to. And that's what they're doing. Look, look at what she did. She made this for me. Peter sends everybody out because he knows God's about something different. Yet he doesn't say, he doesn't say any magic words. There's no spell cast here. There's no formula. What does he do? He gets on his knees and he prays. Now, I, I, be, I believe that Peter believed God could do it. But I wonder if he was a little shocked when he did. Right? Oh, Lord, you can do all things to be your will, raise your daughter to life. And what if, when he opened his eyes, like peaked, holy cow, he did it, you know. <laughs> there she is, she sat up. This miracle, of all miracles, points us ultimately to the greatest miracle. What all miracles point to is the cross and the empty tomb. That's what they're all funneling us toward. The miracle from which all other miracles flow is the miracle of the cross and the resurrection. This is the power of the gospel, essentially, that Jesus Christ conquers sin and death. In fact, Paul, at the end of his life, he writes a second letter to his younger brother in the faith, a man named Timothy, and in that letter, he says that God, through his gospel, has abolished death. What a phrase. It's abolished it. Like the great end to, to this earthly existence, the void, the thing we all fear, it's coming for all of us, and it's 100%, and you can't escape it. The gospel says, you don't have to worry about that. That's a door to a whole new life with me. That's not the end. That's not to be feared. That's not to undo you. The gospel conquers the great darkness, the great void, the great fear of human life. It transforms it. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, remember this is the apostle Paul who was Saul, killing Christians, says, where, O oh death, is your victory? Where is your sting? Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ, our Lord. See, the conversion of Saul the healing of Aeneas, the raising of Tabitha to life, these are all just stories of how God radically transforms things, turns things around. This is what Jesus does. Apart from him, you, are, you and I are as unable to take a step toward God, spiritually speaking, as a paralyzed person is to get up and walk. You and I are as unable, apart from Christ, to live a life that pleases God as a corpse is from getting up and living. He has to come to us. And the message of the gospel is, he does. He did and he does. The book of Acts, friends, is testifying that the Jesus who taught and healed and preached and lived and loved on earth is still alive and well. And he's still reaching people. He's still healing people. He's still doing miraculous things in people's lives. How many of you were here a couple weeks ago when we saw Matt Caterer's story, Matt's story on the screen? What's the greater miracle? I mean, I know there's a lot of people in our church who have serious physical issues going on. We get the prayer list. We pray as a staff every Wednesday, and our I Pray community prays weekly. That can be a heavy burden for people that are suffering. It can be all-consuming. For those of us that follow Jesus, we have to remind ourselves that's not the greater miracle. God can heal me. He can. And we should, we should pour out our hearts asking him to. But always with the greater hope that what, what, he, what, what ultimately matters, he's done at the cross. The ultimate healing, the ultimate redemption and liberation, he has done. The story of the book of Acts is not just that this thing called the church, this, this, this social. socio a cultural movement happened in the first century, but that the resurrection power, which we read about, is alive and well. And that's why we say, Pastor Brian and Sterling and I over and over again, that, our, that we're living this story. When we come to church, I, I forget this too. I can, be, I can get consumed with, I've got meetings to attend, I've got emails to return, I've got sermons to write, lessons to plan, you know, and, and, and stuff to do. 
And forget what church is, what we're a part of. And I bet it's the same for you. You've got to drop your kids off here. You've got to make sure this gets filled out. You've got these things to worry about. And, oh, yeah, we're going to go on Sunday if we're not too exhausted, the church. And we forget. We forget. We lose sight of what God has called us to. This is not just an ancient story that's curious to us and fascinating and historically interesting. This is our story. We have been called into this family through the redemptive power of Jesus Christ. The power that raised him from the dead is the power that heals your sin and mine and brings us and calls us brothers and sisters and makes us part of this church. Not just FBCG, his church in the world, this movement. I mean, I, I don't want to be a part of a church that's just a nice, comfortable, suburban, spiritual club. I fear sometimes you know, that, that, that that's the drift we're headed on unless we fight against it. Now, I don't know many, all of you that well. I know some of you pretty well. What was it that, that um, Frodo said at his birthday party? I like less than half of you half as much as you deserve. I like the other half of you half as much as whatever he said. Right? I know some of you. God knows us all intimately. He knows the stuff that gets in our way. He's brought us into something powerful here. And this story for me reminds me, the point of these miracles, all of them in the Bible, is not to wow us, it's to point us to the, to the greatest miracle, to Christ and his cross and his resurrection, which is why we gather, which is what we exist for. Don't miss the point. Don't stare at the finger. Stare at the cross. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the power of this message. Not mine, yours. The story of your church, how it began, how it has changed lives and spread throughout the world, and how it is doing that still today. Not through the, not through the power of human ingenuity or human philosophy or anything that we've ever thought of or done, but solely through the power of your gospel and your spirit at work in the lives of your people. Thank you for this reminder that we are not here to play church. We are here to be part of this radical community, redeemed by your grace, forgiven by your love, and set loose in the world for the sake of your glory. Help us to see that. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.